Good afternoon, everybody. I welcome uh, my fellow committee members, our distinguished panelists, and the public to the first hearing of the Select Committee on Craft Brewing and Distilling. I want to begin by thanking Speaker Atkins to, uh, for creating this committee and for naming me as chair. When I asked Speaker Atkins to create this committee, my hope was that it would serve as an opportunity to have a public dialogue about two important sectors in California's robust economy. Small craft brewers and distillers employ thousands of workers, generate millions of dollars in local, state, and federal revenues, and are active and engaged members of our communities. Both industries face regulatory challenges and can benefit from the public policy oversight of this committee. Today, we will be discussing craft brewing and the role of the industry in California. Throughout the state, we are seeing more and more craft breweries establishing and expanding throughout California. Over the last several years, craft brewing has become the fastest growing segment in the beer industry, and California has become a leader in craft brewing. I believe this sector will continue to grow and thrive and be a vital piston in California's economic engine. Before we proceed further, I'd like to ask uh, any members if you'd like to make some opening comments. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'd also like to, uh, without any objections, uh, that we have uh, photographers here in the room. All right, fantastic members. So here's how I'd like to conduct today's hearing. Uh, first, Tom McCormick of the California Craft Brewers Association is going to join us up here at the table, and he's going to provide a, uh, an overview of craft brewing in California. Mr. McCormick, please join us. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, I am Tom McCormick. I'm the executive director of the California Craft Brewers Association. The CCBA is the trade association that represents the craft brewing industry in California. We have uh, just about 570 craft breweries in California right now. They are opening up at the rate of, on average, about two every week. So it is absolutely a growing industry. Um, and our association represents uh, all the craft breweries from Sierra Nevada, which is uh, the third largest craft brewery in the country, the largest craft brewery here in California, all the way down to the very, very smallest, what we call nano brewery. We do have members that are literally one person operations. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start a little bit by giving a brief um, history of the craft brewing industry in California because um, it's um, something we're very proud of. The craft brewing industry was born right here in California. That goes back uh, now 50 years to 1965 when Fritz Maytag, who's the great grandson of the founder of the Maytag appliance family, was going to graduate school at Stanford and he would go down to his favorite tavern a couple times uh, a week and have a beer that was called Anchor Steam. And he loved that beer and had many, many Anchor Steams. It changed in its flavor profile quite a bit because it was kind of a floundering brewery, not doing a very good job at the time, but he loved that beer. And one day he ordered his favorite Anchor Steam, and the bartender said, Fritz, you better enjoy that beer because it's the last one you will ever have. We just received our last keg. The brewery's going out of business. Fritz Maytag walked down or went and visited the brewery, met the owners, fell in love with it, and ended up buying the brewery uh, a short time later. And that was really the, the birthplace of the modern craft brewing industry in 1965 because Fritz Maytag took that brewery and really converted it into brewing authentic styles of beer and recreating styles of beer that had really never been uh, brewed or served in California since pre-prohibition. So some um, porters and stouts, uh, first contemporary IPA was brewed uh, at Anchor Brewing Company. 
So Fritz really uh, struggled for the first uh, number of years, but that really was truly the first craft brewery in the modern day era since uh, pre-prohibition. The second birth in the industry uh, occurred in Sonoma County in 1976 when Jack McAuliffe opened the new Albion Brewing Company. And that was the very first from the ground up microbrewery. And Jack had served in the Navy in Britain and had British ales over there, came back to the United States and found that there was really only one style of beer generally available to the public here. That's a kind of a watered-down, Pilsner-style lager. So he started home brewing. Then Jack saw what Fritz was doing over there in the city, and he decided that he would open a brewery too. So in 1976, uh, after scrounging together some used dairy equipment, uh, he started the very first microbrewery from the ground up in the United States. So it slowly evolved from there. The next notable opening was Sierra Nevada Brewing Company in um, 1979. And he too, Ken Grossman, the founder and owner, um, scrounged together brewing equipment. You couldn't find brewing systems to buy at that time. So these very first microbreweries were really kind of a piecemeal scrounging pieces and parts together and, and starting these very, very small breweries. Uh, the next kind of notable mark in the history of our industry, of the craft brewing industry here in California, was in 1982 when the brew pub bill was passed and the governor signed that into law. The governor that signed that into law is a fam familiar name, Jerry Brown, and that became law January 1st, 1983. And by September of that year, 1983, we had the first brew pub here in California. So it was a very, very slow growth process throughout the 1980s. It began to kind of pick up momentum in the 1990s. Um, we continue to grow today, of course, and we are where we are today, which is an amazing leap from the early days of the craft brewing industry. Because craft brewing, which was literally born here in California, is now seen all around the world. We get calls at the association from people from Ireland, from Britain, from Germany, from um, Brazil, from China, looking to open a craft brewery. And they look to California as being the roots of the industry and, and, and being the inspiration for them. So California truly is the birthplace of the craft brewing industry, which has now really altered dramatically kind of the beer culture, not just here in the United States, but uh, globally. So we're proud to have that piece of history here in California. Uh, the industry today is very unique. It's very, very different from most industries in that most people that get into this industry, really all the startups in this industry are very, very small startups. We see some large um, craft breweries like Sierra Nevada and Lagunitas and Anchor Stone Brewing Company. These are now sizable businesses, but each and every one of them started very, very small, typically with just a few people and um, very minimal amount of financing. And that's still the case today. You'll hear from a couple of breweries that um, started very small and have since been able to grow. But virtually all the startups that we see today, are they're not uh, heavily financed. They're not coming and starting as large companies. They're starting as, as very, very small operations and, and growing from there. It's also a very unique kind of cast of characters. These are not uh, typically business or finance people that start these companies. It's um, people who are passionate about beer and passionate about brewing. Uh, they come from all walks of life. It's a very, very creative uh, group of people to work with. Um, but they have a very different profile than I think most industries that are growing to this nature. They're kind of part scientist, um, part artist, part entrepreneur, and um, a lot of them don't have very strong business skills. And as an association, that's what we uh, do try to provide for them. So as an association, we really try to, to provide guidance and education for our membership. Um, and that's becoming a greater and greater challenge as we have more and more breweries starting up. These breweries are also very much a part of their communities. Um, we see these small businesses that start up with these tasting rooms 
often become kind of the living room of the community. And these are not typical bars that stay open to 2 a.m. They are more typical of bringing together families and children and the dogs and people kind of hanging out um, almost like a living room environment. And so we, we see in a lot of areas that these breweries and tasting rooms actually help promote and revitalize uh, the neighborhood and surrounding communities. These breweries also give a lot back to their communities because, again, these are individuals who typically come from the communities that they are starting their businesses in. So they are part of the community. Um, we live in a very regulated industry, as you probably are aware of. Um, it's generally a, a, a friendly regulatory uh, environment. Um, it works generally. It works uh, very well for us right now. Um, at the repeal of prohibition, we had uh, across the country a, a strict three-tier system and strict Tidehouse laws uh, that were implemented. Then this was a reaction to uh, ensure that kind of the, the chaos that existed before le and leading up to prohibition didn't occur again. Um, but this structure has been modified gradually and uh, slowly over the years. Um, the culture and society that we live in today obviously is much, much different than it was leading up to prohibition. So these strict tight house and three-tier uh, structures is really not appropriate uh, necessarily for today's um, culture and society, um, but they do work as it is. Again, they've been modified, and I would say probably the most important um, privilege that the beer manufacturer's license has here in California that allows us to start from these very, very small businesses up to these sizable, successful businesses such as Sierra Nevada Stone and Lagunitas and others is the ability for self-distribution and our privileges to sell directly to the consumer, our retail privileges um, at the brewery. Um, I would it's probably a, a bold statement, but I would say that this industry may not even exist or certainly not exist to the extent that it does today without self-distribution and, and retail privileges. So that has really allowed these small businesses to gain a foothold and gain traction and grow and become larger businesses. So those are really the most important privileges that uh, we have. It works well for us now. We're um, occasionally making smaller adjustments um, to allow for business opportunities for our members, but um, those are the privileges that work best for us at this point. Um, we work very closely with the Department of Alcoholic Beverage and Control. We work very closely with our other stakeholders in the industry, um, and we really kind of promote a cooperative effort when it comes to the legislative efforts, and uh, we look forward to, to doing that going forward as, all, as well. Um, that's all I had for today, unless you have any questions. No, that was really fantastic, Mr. McCormick. Thank, thank you. And to just kick off some questions for you, if, if other members have questions as well, that's great. How does California, if, if it was the birthplace of craft brewing, how are we faring vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other states in, uh, in, in the U.S., and, and what would you attribute that to? We we're faring very, very well, and, and Bart will speak to some of those. Bart Watson will speak to some of those uh, statistics. Um, but I think generally when people th in the United States think of the craft brewing industry, there's just a few states that come to mind, and California is certainly one of them. I think people kind of think of Oregon, Washington, California, Colorado, um, but when people think of craft brewing, they, they, they think of California. So uh, from a business standpoint, um, I think we are doing very, very well. There's many other states that really kind of envy uh, the privileges that we have here in California and, and envy the vibrancy of the craft brewing industry here in California. So I would say that we are probably the leader uh, in the craft brewing industry nationwide. Any other 
Um, quick question. The art, the art of craft brewing obviously has been around for, for centuries. I, I, I think uh, it's as American as, uh, as Sam, Samuel Adams is. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what is it that took so long for the craft brewing movement to actually take hold uh, to where uh, you, you said that, that it was in the 60s or 70s was when the original breweries uh, uh, were founded? Mm-hmm. Um, but then, even more recently, what what do you th- what do you attribute to the the boom and the and the, the the major economic growth to? Yeah, and just another statistic is in 1979, 1980, right when Sierra Nevada was uh, starting up, there were 40 breweries in the entire country, and now there's 3,400. So, between that period of time, uh, is when this tremendous growth happened. And you, you know, you're absolutely right. There was a craft brewing industry here in the United States pre-prohibition, um, but it was after prohibition uh, for a variety of, of, of reasons um, that consolidation in the brewing industry that really took hold in the 50s and 60s uh, due to refrigeration and transportation and kind of mass advertising and lifestyle differences and there was that era of the late 50s uh, through the 60s and 70s where Virtually all the breweries and imports were making one style of beer, and, and you know that's a kind of a Pilsner style of, of beer. So there was a singular style of beer, and, and that really became known as beer in American culture. So it was those first pioneers in the craft in the uh, contemporary craft brewing industry that began to produce um, these other styles of beers that have been around for centuries. And I think it, it kind of dovetailed to a change in our culture where people began showing um, greater interest in local and regional products. They began showing a greater interest in quality products. And we've seen this trend happen in other consumer food and beverage products, such as coffee and, and even ice cream. You know, we never saw a gourmet coffee um, you know, in the 60s and 70s. So it kind of dovetailed with the cultural change. And I think what really promoted it was really just a consumer interest in two things. One was having a choice in taste in in beer and discovering that there was this whole new realm of flavors and styles. And they really had fun with that. The second thing was I think people really enjoy the, the local aspect of it. So to be able to go down to a, a local brewery and, and, and hang out there and see the tanks and try the beer that's brewed right there, um, and, and it, j- it just had that local and, and regional feel. So I think it was a combination of, um, of choice, having that choice available to them in, in new flavors and new colors and, and new styles, and also um, enjoying the, the, the localness of it all. Thank you. And then one, one other question. Um, with the three different tiers, um, you know, obviously the, the tide house structure should be tweaked on occasion in order to uh, to match the the needs of the market and and also provide the protections of uh, of the three different tiers. Um, obviously, we've seen it happen where where there was corruption in the in the system right. before. Um, but in moving forward, in order to to um, to stimulate um, the industry in a very very fair way to all three tiers, what kind of tweaks and changes do you think would be good, thoughtful changes that would keep the three different tiers um, working together and, on the same, and, and kind of moving forward to, to expand the industry? Well, we work very closely with the wholesalers. We made uh, kind of a, a small adjustment last year in, in kind of a compromising with the wholesalers and reducing the number of duplicate licenses that have the retail privilege. Um, and I thought that was very reasonable and and and, and fair, and I, th- I thought it was good for our industry, and it's certainly good for the for the middle tier. Uh, that basically reduced the number of remote retail outlets that a beer manufacturer could have. Um, and then, secondly, we're working on a bill together with the wholesalers this year to kind of adjust the retail privileges of the two beer manufacturers' licenses here in California, the Type 23 and the, and the Type uh, 01. So, and we've worked together on that 
to come to agreement and consensus so that will be moving forward um, and we'll move that forward together in the future um, in in the immediate future you know I, I there there's really nothing that comes to mind that would be um, a needed adjustment um, certainly for our industry um, the wholesale middle tier is very healthy um, it's going through a period of pretty dramatic consolidation right now that makes it difficult for our members just simply because there's less choices out there and that's where uh, self-distribution uh, becomes very um, important to us and also the ability to self-distribute other uh, beer manufacturers beards because that just opens up competition and, and opportunity for everybody um, but the, uh, the 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 three tiers really um, are each other's partners so it it works really well right now I think it's kind of a modern day version of the three-tier system and that has been slowly adjusted over time and and I, I think generally it works very very well great you, are there, sorry yeah it's okay, you, one is more. There, let me just ask yeah. if another person has a question <laughs> all right give a, another person opportunity to speak all right any other questions all right mr. Linder didn't mean to dominate the meeting here. <laughs> um, one one other question: If, um, in say for instance, someone wants to start a, a, a brewing, um, you know, so they go, want to take it from a from a garage brewery to uh, a commercial a local commercial brewery, and then and then through the ranks. What where are the landmarks where the where it's the most difficult as far as government relations or government uh, regulations is concerned? Well, making that leap from home brewer to a commercially licensed brewery obviously is is the most difficult and um, for for good reason, obviously, because the bright line between home brewing and a commercially licensed uh, operation is um, the when you have to be licensed to have um, to enter your beer into commerce. So anytime that you uh, have a transaction of value for the beer that you've made, monetary or otherwise then you you need to be licensed for that so that's a bright line that i think everyone understands and respects very well um, the threshold for uh, getting a license as a commercially uh, commercially licensed brewery is um, you know it, it's a process that takes generally four to eight months and it's reviewed very very closely by both the TTB on the federal side and, and, and the ABC here on the state side um, it, we see um, probably most of the resistance often coming from um, the local level that doesn't quite understand what a tasting room is and they think it's a bar and so we have seen a lot of um, new um, entries into the industry that are applying for a, a beer manufacturer's license um, have a restriction put on their license that they can't have a tasting room and, and once we go in and we talk to the local entity and describe to them that you know the hours of operation are typically closing at 8 or 9 p.m. and it's they're only selling the beers that they brew on premise and um, that it's kind of family in nature uh, they get it and they understand. So, uh, but a lot of the the regulatory um, difficulties come on the local level, and um, sometimes not so much from the ABC, but um, other regulating a agencies, typically health department, um, getting the the right licensing from the local entity, and so on and so forth. Once a brewery is established. Um, then that the growth forward is 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 generally um, you know they're they're living under the regulatory umbrella, but there's no real specific difficult thresholds to get through once uh, once a establishment is licensed. All right, if there are not any further questions, I think we're all very excited about going to Linder's Ale House in the near future. <laughs> So, Mr. McCormick, thank you very much for uh, providing much. testimony today. Um, next, I would like to invite Dr. Bart Watson to join us and to discuss the economic impact of craft beer in California. 
uh, Mr. Pardon me, Dr. Watson's got to have one of the most interesting jobs in economics. Uh, he is with the Brewers Association. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to the committee for inviting me to be here. Um, and yes, I, I do have a pretty amazing job. Um, uh, my name is Bart Watson. I'm the chief economist of the Brewers Association. Uh, we're a national not-for-profit trade association that represents America's now 3,600 and growing small and independent craft breweries. Uh, we're a membership organization, have over 2,600 uh, brewery members, including many in California. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about um, California's growth, uh, the economic impact on the state from small and independent breweries, um, and then um, maybe going forward what some of that uh, the potential looks like in the state. Um, let me start by briefly describing what the economic impact number, that $6.5 billion, what that represents and how we come up with it. Um, so an economic impact typically looks at both the immediate sector, so in this case the three-tier system, brewers, wholesalers, retailers, as well as the other ripples that that, that sector creates in the economy. So um, we measure that direct sector via survey every year that we do of all, every brewery in the country. Um, it, it takes a long time, and I have a ton of forms sitting on my desk every January. Um, and we take from that uh, brewers' employment, we look at their production, we convert that into revenue based on some other surveys. Uh, we fill in any gaps um, here in California. We fill in with the excellent uh, data you have from the Board of Equalization here in California uh, that does a great job um, tracking uh, production for excise tax purposes. Um, and so we can then assign a value chain and say, here's how much value is created from the brewing sector as it goes through the wholesale tier and the retail tier here in California. Um, we then put that into uh, a modeling software. The one uh, we use is called Implan. It was originally developed by the U.S. Forestry Service. Um, and it's an input-output model. So it says, all right, a brewer makes X barrels of beer. What does that mean for the wider economy? For the indirect, the supplier impacts all the things that go into brewing beer, because it's more than just you know, having a kettle on your stove at home when you become a professional brewer. Um, and then the induced impacts, the further ripples in the economy. And um, in California, you get a lot of those indirect and induced impacts because of the overall strength of the California economy. Um, so indirect, those are the suppliers. I wrote down a few. I went in our database, and I wrote down a few of the types of suppliers that you have here in California, most of which are new and have built up around the California brewing industry. Industry. Um, you don't have a lot of the raw material suppliers, hops and malt, but you do have draft system companies, companies that make boilers and chilling equipment, um, insurance and legal companies, and these are companies that are specifically targeting these services toward breweries. When you have 570 breweries, a lot of businesses build up around them. Ceramic decorating, water professionals, tank companies, packaging companies, signage companies, architects that are specifically focused on building breweries, filtration companies, um, education, we're going to hear from um, 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 professor uh, from UC Davis in just a second. Um, yeast services, lab services. So you can see that there are incredible numbers of supplier industries that are part of that economic impact that are created in addition to just the brewery jobs. Um, finally, it then measures the overall ripples, what are known as induced impacts. This is because there are 14,000 people directly employed at breweries and 48,000 full-time equivalent jobs created by the brewing sector here in California. And those workers spend additional money. They're out buying California produce and other California uh, products. So when you add all those ripples together, the direct, the indirect, and the induced, you get $6.5 billion, which is a measurable part of the California economy, which is something to say in an economy that's $2 trillion plus dollars. Uh, but it's about 0.3% of the California economy, and 48,000 full-time equivalent jobs, which um, in, in an era where job creation is harder than it's ever been before um, is nothing to sniff at, particularly that many of them are high-value-added manufacturing jobs. Um, if anything, this underestimates the total impact that brewing has. Uh, one thing it doesn't include are things like tourism and festivals. Um, California, because of its leading position, in the national brewing scene attracts a lot of these. I was actually just in San Diego last week for the National Home Brewers Conference, uh, which attracted over 3,000 people to San Diego, many of whom were from out of state. Um, and every time I visited a local brewery, there were plenty of those visitors there spending their dollars and enjoying your lovely California breweries. Um, so that 6.5 million, or excuse me, billion, billion with a B, 6.5 billion, if anything, is a very conservative estimate of the total impact. Um, 
You had asked earlier a little bit about where California sits um, in, in perspective. And, um, you know, one thing that makes California unique is that it has a really wide variety of business models. And I'll echo what Mr. McCormick said about um, the regulatory environment providing for a wide variety of business models here in California. You have very small breweries that are selling almost all of their beer in their tap houses on premise. About a third of California breweries sell 100% of their beer at their brewery, typically a very, very small amount. Um, at the same time, you have nationally and globally recognized brands that are exporting their products not only all over the country, but all over the world. So in 2014, California breweries produced about 3.4 million barrels of beer, uh, a barrel being 31 gallons, and 1.3 million of those were exported out of California. So they're not only building brands that resonate here in California, but brands that resonate around the country and the world um, and are exporting these products, and, and I expect those exports to grow. Um, California has a great brand, and California beer um, is, is really attached to that and part of that now. Um, so this variety of business models also increases the total economic impact by allowing different types of businesses to flourish here from your heavily packaged breweries to uh, more locally f focused ones that are doing more on-premise. Um, I think there's still a lot of room for growth here in California. Um, so you hear these big numbers and you think, oh, have we reached a peak? Um, California has about 12% of the nation's 21 plus population and it actually does better than average in terms of its brewery production. Um, it has about 15.5% of national craft brewery production um, and, and it contributed about 14% of the total national growth last year, which was 18% by volume. Um, but it still only ranks 12th in production per capita and 20th in the number of breweries per capita. So even with 570 breweries and, and two opening per day, um, there's still opportunities for growth. Um, leading states, um, many of these are small states, so their per capita ratios are a little bit skewed, uh, but have ratios that are sometimes three to four times higher than California. So in absolute numbers, um, California is certainly a leader, if not the leader, in the national brewing economy. Um, but there are still opportunities that exist. Um, to give one example, um, San Diego County has now more than 100 breweries, um, which is 4.6 for every 100,000 21 plus adults in that state. That's a little bit behind the state of Washington and wouldn't be first in the country. If the entire state of California had that ratio, 4.6 for 100,000 adults, you'd have 1,250 breweries here in California. So I think there are still opportunities in plenty of regions around the state uh, for continued growth um, and continued job creation. And I'll stop there and ask for questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What are some of the biggest challenges the uh, industry is facing? Um, you know, there are numerous challenges. Um, many of them are related to growth. Um, as with any growth industry, the industry has grown double digits nationally seven out of the last nine years. Um, there are challenges just with sourcing materials, um, getting an appropriate supply of labor. Um, luckily, we're seeing many of the raw materials, things like hops and barley, grow, but, but that's certainly a challenge. Um, you know, getting tanks, waiting lists on tanks. You can ask some of the brewers who are coming up later if they've bought tanks recently, how long they had to wait for them. Um, but, you know, I think there are also market issues that, that all brewers are going to face. You know, you have over 500 breweries here in California, so standing out and differentiating yourself becomes more challenging. Like I said, I think there are still plenty of opportunities for, for growth, particularly at the local area. Um, but, you know, brewers need to stand out. They need to differentiate in a way that they haven't before. Um, we're also seeing increasing competition in the marketplace, uh, particularly in the on-premise. That's bars and restaurants. Um, you know, bars and restaurants have a lot of uh, craft brewers on tap at this point. Um, nationally, market share is about 11% by volume, but in the on-premise, it's, it's over 30 share now. Um, so finding tap handles can become tough for new brewers. I think that's one reason that the regulatory freedoms that you have here in California to self-distribute and more importantly to sell um, through a tap room so you can get your brand established before you take it out into the marketplace are, are very important. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Nazarian. If you mentioned that and I missed that, I apologize, but I just want to know a little bit about tourism. How does this impact tourism? It's, and, and, you know, long view, you'd love to see uh, these distilleries be able to do what the wine industry has done. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not going to be the same because you know, the grapes are harvested on site and then go through the processing. This isn't the same situation. But uh, how, 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 how have you seen this impacting uh, tourism, promoting tourism, and how has it increased over time? And is there, uh, what opportunities are there given what other states have, may have done mm -hmm. to further expand? Well, you know, some of tourism is going to be promoted by groups like the CCBA, but uh, based on a recent survey uh, that we did nationally, um, there's lots of brewery tourism going on, and it's growing. So 
Um, we asked our members how many people visited their brewery every year. Um, and based on the sample we got, we extrapolated out, um, there are about 10 million people who visit breweries every year. Those aren't necessarily unique people, but 10 million visitors to breweries every year. And then we further asked them, what percentage are from your local area and what percent are from out of your local area? And it was about 50-50. So about 50% of the people who are going through breweries, particularly some of the larger, more well-known breweries you have here, places like Sierra Nevada, Stone, Anchor, you're getting people who are coming from around the state, around the country, around the world to visit. Um, when Natalie from Russian River is up here later, um, make sure to ask her about Pliny the Younger Day, which um, has a measurable economic impact on Sonoma County and attracts people from all over the world who come, buy hotel rooms, stay there, and spend their money every year. So um, these businesses, you know, particularly some of the strong brands that have been built here in California, are growing tourism by attracting people who you know, are coming specifically to visit those breweries. That's a primary reason for their visit.